Welcome back, everybody, to the Startup Studios podcast with Raj and Seth, where we interview our friends who build startups. How are you doing, Raj? Oh, sorry. Busy on Tinder. Quick. What's up, man? <laughs> uh, excited, man. Super excited. Rand, it's a pleasure to meet, man. I can't... Ex- no. We've been having a lot of fun over the past few weeks, kind of building up the Startup Studios. So Seth sings your praise. I can't wait to get into it. Yeah. No, nice we've, uh, we've been looking forward to having you on here for a while because, well, for me, this is kind of going to be the, uh, you know, let's shit on Seth episode, I believe. Just because I know both of you have some pretty good stories about me. <laughs> yo, this is gonna, yo, Rand, let's just <laughs> rip his kid <cow. laughs> <laughs> But we'll we'll get into that. But Rand, thank you so much for joining us, man. We're good to be here. Grateful. Good to be here. And then, actually, before we get started, so I do want to introduce. Uh, so Rand and uh, you and I have been co-founders a couple of times over, uh, like a while ago. And then uh, Raj and I had a short stint where I was fortunate enough to be considered to be like his co-founder and CEO, and we worked very, very closely in the trenches. And then we just decided to work together for startups, or sorry, for startup studios. <laughs> so now we have our startup studios co-founders. So, um, you know, I'm I'm super excited for you guys to connect. And um, he's got, uh, Raj. If you want to introduce yourself, it's yeah, awesome. man. Again, man, it's a pleasure, man. Um, I'm a bit different from Seth. I'm not exactly tech, you know, technology focused. So I'm not a, I'm a non-technical founder. I actually started my background, uh, my career in finance. So I started uh, energy investment banking over at Goldman. Uh, left there after about 11 months because I knew exactly what I wanted to do, which was run a hedge fund. Cobbled together a few shekels and over about 12 years, screwed that to about a billion eight. Um, had an exit in 15 back to Goldman, kind of became a dad, uh, followed by passion, health and wellness. So I played college ball and had a brick and mortar company in Seattle that worked really well. And from it, you know, a SaaS solution came. So Kind of ventured into my big thing was scalability, and the only way on, on the brick and mortar side was more like a franchise type model. And I was like, "Nah, I'm good. I don't like people." So, kind of went uh, through the scale in tech, and meandered my way through it. Was lucky enough to meet Seth on LinkedIn, just seeing some of his amazing posts, just really understanding. You know, at that point as well, like I'd consider myself a generalist. I'm like, "Hey, I want to get on the field and make a play," and, and that was it. And Seth was the same way. So we've had a lot of fun since, and really realized there's a, there's an underlying theme with a lot of founders, a lot of startups, a lot of, you know, how the game is, especially if you're not a repeat founder, not technical, you know, not a technical founder of the sort. So been having a lot of fun getting the resources together for founders who'd like us. Awesome. Awesome. Get to deal with him. So. <laughs> I he, know, he's, he's a, he's a, a ball of love and energy. I mean, he, <laughs> he was on me the entire time we worked together at, at startups. So I enjoyed my time. There were certain times where he and I wanted to choke each other out, but, uh, you very know, few. <laughs> you knew I was the grappler, so you didn't want to get into that. <laughs> well, actually, no, I mean, if we're gonna yeah. throw salt on Seth just for fun, I was lucky. <laughs> I was lucky enough to meet Seth at a point where his his business acumen, his tech savvy, is, is second to none. But it was really interesting because he kept pushing me. Like he's a he's a he's a he's a human being. He's yeah. a human being. You know, he kept pushing me on like, hey man, like we should do these founder questions together. I'm like, yeah, whatever, dude, shut the fuck up. I don't care about these founder questions. But they were so important, and it's crazy because I remember one of them was like, hey, listen when one of the founders is stressed or like they're going through a fight with their wife or something like, how do they respond? Who's going to pick up the slack? And the, and it was so interesting, like to audit myself on that, like, Oh shit, I guess that is really appropriate because I might blow the company up on my own. I mean, listen, that's a very, that's a very real situation, right? It's the, these are the stories that don't actually get told right. in this world. Like we hear all these stories about, oh, I took this company from zero dollars to a unicorn. Eh. And like, they don't talk about the work in the trenches, all of the pain, the failures. We hear this like fail fast mentality, but they really don't talk about the, the failures and like how that kind of eats away at you. And you have to be like very resilient. But on the other side, like people found companies and they've got a family, they've got a child and there's all these other things that are going on in their head. And like the way that you manage those emotions while tackling the stress of founding something with, I would call a second partner, like you're, you're, you're kind of being in a, um, uh, an open relationship, I guess, in that situation where you got two, two with the, wives, the same like, amount of respect. Two, exactly. So I, man, I, there's so much to talk about there. Like <laughs> I get it. No, my advisor, he, 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 my, one of our board guys, he goes, it's funny. You had these, these like cliche romantic words, like, you know, work-life balance. There is no such thing in a startup. It, it's just like manage as much bullshit as you can, but they're really, it's like your whole family's in the startup. Like, let's just be real. Uh, 100%. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really funny being at companies in the past. And I, I'll tell you some more stuff, like some examples. It's like, I really prefer being at the company. That's like the 300 or sub, right. Even in the, the 50 person company, because you can really be yourself, right? Yeah. You can be yourself. I come from a family um, who are Ashkenazi Jews. I'm not very religious, but we still have a lot of that culture where it's it's no bullshit. It's not to be hurtful, but you're just very straight with somebody. You tell them why you think you're wrong and it's not personal. 
And that for me, at like a small startup, you can do that. You can be honest with these people. You form that kind of those, those bonds where you know you're going into the trenches together. So you have to be honest. You can't yeah. be soft about things. And then it's after that where I kind of hate it because you have to build coalitions. I have to work with this person who I may not have the same amount of respect for as I did the other people that I worked with. But now I have to respect them in a certain way. And I've got a sandwich, maybe some, uh, you know, what do they call it? Um, constructive criticism, but I have to sandwich it with something. The shit sandwich, sandwich, man. The oh, shit sandwich. Oh my God. Rand, you are so cool. But stop sucking at this, 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 this. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, that becomes an art too. Oh my. I remember my first time, I won't say which company or the, the person, right? But uh, <clears throat> I was managing a team. Um, they're on the SEO and content side. And I had given this person a project and uh, they just really were, not executing well at all. And I'm of the, the style where I, I try and be very like empathetic to the situation. How can I help you to get, get this better? That's step one for me. Step two is, okay, if it doesn't get better, then I need to challenge them. Maybe they're just not challenged by the work that I'm giving them. So I got to this point where this human uh, gave them a project that was exceptionally important. It had a large budget. It was expected to bring in a lot of money and they absolutely failed at it. And it was not a sign of, hey, they're not capable. This person is exceptionally capable. You could hear them in every meeting when they spoke and when they BSed on things. I'm like, you're capable. You can do this. They just didn't care. And when I came in, I, I said, hey, how do you feel about your work on this project thus far? And we're like 70% of the way through. And I knew that it was an emergency. I was going to have to take over, bring on some other people into the team to help really right the ship here. And the, the person was like, I don't know. I mean, I guess... You know, I see this, that, and the other, and it was a lot of excuses for why maybe the quality wasn't there. And I was just no BS. I was like, I have to tell you, this was extremely disappointing. I've given you every chance in the world to try and make this right. Uh, and you've just failed. I, point blank. I was like, you failed on this. And I was like, I want to figure out how we can go forward so that this doesn't happen again. Do you know what this person did? And not a day later, I have to go into HR because this person turned me in for creating a hostile work environment. And I didn't, so I sat there in HR having to learn how to properly speak to people, how you deliver this feedback. And I, I now know how to do this when you get to larger companies. Uh, I'm, no, fuck you, Rand. I'm no. malleable to- no. No, 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 fuck you. Honestly, honestly, I don't know you from this Zoom call. Did you berate the person? No, not at all. I was. Did you punch them in the face? Nope. Like, what? why, why? Because this is continuing to perpetuate a, a, just bad fucking habits, man. Just bad habits. So I hate to say, I, I hate that I just heard from you. Now I know how to do it. It's like, no, now you don't know how to do it. You don't. I mean, in my defense <laughs> and this HR person's defense, the response that the HR person told me was basically, listen, just document. There's not really a way for us to go and give feedback without a person generally having the availability to complain and do something. So it's like, you've got email, to put it writing or something. Yeah, but still, put them on a, essentially is the, what you have to do. And I was like, in my head, I'm like, that's awful. I yeah. want to help people get better, not put them in a position where they're stressed because they might lose their job because they're not doing the right work. I want to put them in a position where I challenge them and help them to be all that they can be. I'm going to steal the army uh, slogan here, but be all that they can be, you know, like, um, but sadly you're right. Like it, it perpetuates a, a situation where they don't learn. Um, they get put on that pip or whatever you want to call it. And then you end up finding a way to part ways and it sucks. That's yeah, dude, manage up, not out, like truly. And that sucks. I don't empower you to do that, especially on the bigger side, because then you're a public shareholder that like, I, vil I vilify Steph, my, my old lady, because she's super corporate and I fucking hate it. And we'll get it all. Sorry, Steph. Steph's like, oh, gosh, again, again, soapbox, but it's like, cool. Let's hire in mass one month and then fire in mass the next, like, stop it. Just cut the shit cut this shit and that's why i've been so happy working with seth and kind of building it the way we want to build it like truly and then finding enough savages like you ran that are like yeah i understand there's this way but there's also a pocket of people who are just wolves and like we're gonna find a way to go eat together so like sorry i mean like because it i think that whole corporate structure really starts to irk me and you know i was in it and that's why i left Goldman immediately and got to knuckle tattoos it was like the first thing i did because i would never <laughs> go back into it and, and again i'm obviously being spitting a bunch of vitriol because I'm, I'm butthurt but like listen i'm on my wife's like i'm on her insurance let's, let's call a spade a spade here i'm on her corporate insurance so like let's call a spade but i, I see that being super frustrating man. yeah it almost clips your wings 
Very much so, right? Because it it limits me in how much that I can get done, right? Like you have to hire generals. You have to have people that you expect can get, get things done. Um, and in that moment, right? Like what's the stat? It's like uh, the average company like wastes $24,000 in the first two months training a new employee, right? Mm. So, but not that's not even including the work that the team loses, right? Or what happens to that that team of generals that you put together? Did they now become unhappy because now they've got one less general or captain on the team and now you're having to yeah. replace that person and then they have to get in there and start having yeah. to take on the load or train this person and how many times can you do that i mean the questions go on and on right like the problems of this situation I, but again I'm, i i don't know how you fix this with this the corporate structure there's there's too many people at the mckinsey's of the world that have gone to the same mba program that are perpetuating the same things all the time and they're in the smart communities right so all that all those frameworks which especially I think the last couple of years with the with the excess of funding also available, people had or were able to hire these ex consultants for, you know, really good salaries and, and packages and enable them to, you know, switch from that generalist to a specialist kind of mentality, which is like, hey, we want you to be good at this one thing and only one thing, because you know, the, that's the data approach too, right, which is you had one person focusing on one metric, feeding all of it into a machine, which then wasn't really cohesive to begin with. Yeah, no, it just perpetuates waste. It per perpetuates internal waste of like, cool, Rand, you don't look at anything else and none of the dependencies, you stay in your silo because we got to do our other stuff. Oh, it's breaking again. Hmm. Weird. And then nobody knows how to fix it at that point, right? Because everybody's just pointing at, e at each other. <laughs> it gets lost, right? It's just in that one chamber, that, uh, that same echo chamber, right? Yeah, I mean, there's, I've got a lot of gripes with, uh, with these, these, McKinsey of the world, but uh, well, now I'm super. Uh, no, now I'm super well, interested in like you're obviously not a McKinsey, so who are you? <laughs> well, yeah, maybe let's you dive into it. Like, this is really interesting. Yeah, let's dive oh, into it then, right? So, wow, that's, uh, who is Rand you know, Owens? Very philosophical. You're a Virgo, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a Pisces with a Gemini <laughs> rising. Um, you know it, motherfucker, so don't even pretend like you don't. My air <laughs> sign is a, a squirrel. What? We're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna see actual product led growth in a human being in this. <laughs> I have uh, I actually like that. So that's that's amazing. Um, no, I um, I wish I could answer that question. Uh, going back to the the Pisces uh, Gemini rising, that is actually true. My good friend, who's a uh, pretty your good friend, Rand. Good friend. <laughs> he's a he's a he's a writer on a large TV show. He's a good. He, I think Seth knows him as well. Um, For us, yeah. I, I, his girlfriend really is, into it. I, I love her. She's really into it. And like, she was asking me over like COVID, we're, we're like hanging yeah. out, like, give me the time you were blurred. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where all, what? Yeah. All this, all these things. And then she just sent me this like massive text with all this information. And I only remember two things. I'm a Pisces with a Gemini rising. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's all so, you need to know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's great. I mean, I do give credence to these things. I think there's some, something to it, right? Like we can, we can never uh, kick out what the ancients knew, right? Like they, yeah. they had some, I mean, they've been around the, the, the sun a few times. So like they, they knew some things. So, but yeah, that's how I ended up knowing that stuff. But back to the question of who's Rand, I'll, uh, sheesh, I'll give you the long and the short of it. Uh, I'm just a, a guy who grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, family is from the San Francisco Bay Area. My grandfather uh, and grandmother, my dad's side were both in tech, kind of. My, my grandfather worked for NASA and then IBM, trying to get away from NASA. And then IBM was like, you're going back to NASA on a special project there. Um, and my grandmother worked for Lockheed Martin. Um, on my other side of my family, my parents or my, my mom's side were uh, Jews that escaped the Nazis, came in via Canada, got here, set up both, uh, worked for themselves, started their own businesses, that kind of thing. And consequently, my, my parents did as well. They're both, uh, you know, my mom's a shrink, runs her own business, even to this day. At, well, I think she's almost 70, about to be 70 years old. Uh, and my father has been a multiple time entrepreneur as well. So I got the, that same feeling from them. I knew going into college that I wanted to do something in business, even though I was studying, uh, I was studying politics, Middle Eastern politics was my, my focus. Um, but I knew, I knew deep down, even when I was working uh, in state and city council, I was like, this is great, but I want to get into this, this tech sphere. I want to, I want to do something here. I want to start something. I want to blow something up. Um, so I left, I got my first job uh, at a company, an e-commerce company called Meridian Auto Parts. They own some, they're like the largest um, aftermarket uh, car parts company on the West Coast. Now they might be in the, in the United States. Um, it's like early 2000s, right? Early 2000s, man. Back, back in the day when uh, 
you could keyword stuff still and like you you know you buy the exact domain name and you owned that keyword so they owned like <laughs> buy autoparts.com and all of these different things um and that's where i got my 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 hands wet that's where i learned product management uh from both the actual product management side but also from the organic seo side which is a <clears throat> a lost art within the e-commerce world in my opinion um I'd done SEO in, in high school prior, back in the day when you could do like auto blogs and, and made some money doing that. And yeah, it was, that's where I, <laughs> I really like cut my teeth on SEO, but they gave me my first real job and like kind of taught me how that structure works. Um, and then after that, I left, I jumped into a, another startup where it was e-commerce based, but for this small little like speaker, uh, I did some really cool stuff where I hacked uh, Google Suggest. Back in the day, I, I went to... Um, my a micro task worker website and paid them like 10 cents to go search for Kickstarter and then our name. And we were like, not supposed to be doing anything. Like we, we weren't supposed to be a big pro uh, product, but we ended up being the third most suggested uh, term for kit. Like you started typing nice. in Kickstarter, Boombotics was the next thing that came up and that launched our Kickstarter off. Um, and then where I go, I went to Happy Inspector after that, um, grew them, we got, we got some good revenue and then I uh, got an opportunity to go work really early at a company called Keep Truck and now called Motive. Um, wasn't the first. Actually, before, before we we get into that, like, so with with so Boombotics, real quick, like, yeah, what kind of saying, company what, what was it? What the fuck is called Boombotics? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, like a little more detail. I love like, loose, yeah, I love like what they did. And then we uh, had Boombotics. It was awesome, and we found the moon. Okay, and then I did that. Like, <laughs> wait, what? Like, no, no Boombotics. These were again. Uh, so for for viewers and listeners as well, these were the early days of Kickstarter. Like, there were no Ooh. like you couldn't really Google or, or uh, even interact with that many people who were successful at these campaigns. Um, so the creativity and the planning around them were very different than today. Oh, yeah. I mean, there was really no playbook at that point, right? So nobody knew what they were kind of doing. There was just kind of like, if you had started a, uh, a Kickstarter and you were successful before, people were charging these exorbitant amounts of money to be a consultant for it. Um, but yeah, really early days. Uh, Boombotics, uh, I'll give you the spiel. It was a Bluetooth speaker that had this little weird design. Ultimately, they moved away from that design into something that was more like a hexagon uh, shape. But it looked like, the original one looked like this little character kind of um and it was started by these two guys uh that i still talk to today they're, they're great humans um and it was just rad it was more for the extreme sports world being a, a downhill mountain biker uh as one of my one of my three passions in the world of sports um it like it connected with me having something that was super durable that i could play and blast on my chest while i was out riding around san francisco or downhilling in santa cruz i loved it i was i bought in um so yeah, that was Boombotics. And then I ended up leaving and going to Happy Inspector, now Happy Co. And that was a, a great experience. But um, what was Happy Inspector? Happy See? Inspector was a, is still to this day, a property inspection app. So coming from a family where my dad and mom have invested in property back in the day when it was still feasible to buy property for most people, um, when you could assume people's mortgages, uh, they, they acquired a few doors themselves and have done very well for themselves. And I knew that industry. I knew the pains of rentals and when people were leaving after a long-term lease, like what happens to your property? How do you make sure that you can collect and keep portions of the deposit without them coming after you? Uh, as we know, state of California tends to be very uh, uh, renter friendly and not the owner friendly. So we, uh, when I jumped into that company, they were essentially trying to figure out where do we find property managers? Um, how do we get in with them? Like they're right now, they're old school. Like it's, they bring a old, camera that still has the flash they're not even using their phone um they're taking photos they're taking notes on their yellow uh pad and then they're like gluing it together typing up something putting a spreadsheet together and then they're sending it off to like make sure things are kosher while they take somebody's deposit for the damages that they did so it was a pretty easy sell to a lot of these property managers like the average property manager at that time had about 40 doors and some of them even higher like we got into equity residential which had like thousands of doors um so that was that was uh, the next step that we went. They ended up rebranding under Happy Co rather than Happy Inspector. That gave them a little bit of a larger um, movement. They could go into like cruise liners and everything else that you know didn't fall within property because any physical asset needs some data behind it, right? Like these days, you want to have data on everything. And there's a whole area of the world where these are not connected to the internet. They're they're hardware. They're assets that just do not speak to the internet. Sorry. You, you, you got to do it the old fashioned way. So 
they they've got this great model they're growing like fire right now um and they do another side of the business which is due diligence and they allow people to go in buy these large packages come in when you walk the property and then at the end they give all these data analytics and like they can tell you a lot about whether or not you should buy a property these types of things it was it was really cool really cool. most of it's multifamily. most of it's multifamily. at least at that time i haven't spoken to jindo about where they've they've diversified in the in the recent the early days again right? yeah in the early days um they're now sheesh i think i left it 50 employees or whatever it was 16 employees i think they're now three or 400 employees um they might even be more than that but i'm actually meeting with jendo at the end of this week serendipity i guess uh to be talking about him but yeah yeah that's uh that's one of my other really nice growing experiences in my very early career and then after that um i started working with a guy named obed um I, I known him through some friends. They were starting a startup called Keep Trucking. They needed somebody to come in and help them get like a lot of the foundational work done for their marketing, testing out channels. What were they going to do? And I came in and started building all that. I was there for five and a half years almost. Uh, yeah, just just on different marketing teams, building things out, hiring uh, senior management for the team, or helping to hire senior management out. Um, yeah, and those were the great years. That was that was crazy going. We built for two years knowing that there was going to be a mandate that was going to force all these, these truck drivers and these huge uh, companies to, to buy an ELD software, right? So prior to that, they didn't really have to have it. So these fleet management softwares were just not within their, their scope. They didn't want this. In fact, we would get all these calls. Trump is going to change this. He's, going to, he's not going to allow the, the Congress to do this. And they didn't realize that Trump was actually part of the, the, the group that's <laughs> that helped push this uh, policy in place because they wanted to make money off of this. And uh, <laughs> the night that it happened, we had built a database and got this mobile app out over the last two years where I, I built their SEO and their app store optimization out. We were getting half a million organic visits to the website. People were signing up in the thousands every day. It's still, I think, to this day, their biggest channel. Um, mobile app crushed it and we became the fastest growing startup in history. We beat out Slack at that time. Nobody talks about it because we did so little branding to tech workers, which was something we ended up having to change up later on because uh, we were so hyper-focused on getting truckers and all of those companies, whether they're in enterprise, mid-market, SMB, VSMB, into the, the product. Uh, and then at a certain point, we were like, okay, yeah, we, we got to get talent in. So we kind of need to start marketing this out to tech people and it can't just be a, a trucking platform. Um, and so and you cool. joined Keep Trucking at what, like Series A? <clears throat> oh, I don't... Listen, I think they were at Series Seed when I got in there. We were, they didn't have an office yet. I was working out of Obed's uh, apartment in the Tenderloin. We were like meeting up two or three days a week at that point. And then at a certain point, they got an office that was over this Subway sandwich place. And it was like 15 to 20 of us, I think. And there was a pool table and I was still living in the South Bay. So I wasn't coming up every day to be in the office, but it was, it was wild times. It was wild times. And then we expanded. We got to two or 3,000 people at one point. And yeah. Keep trucking, I think, is one of those like super incognito unicorns that just grew like crazy, walked the walk and went under yeah. the radar. It, it's funny. I always make jokes and I won't name any of the, the competitors that I, I think this of, but like there were competitors out there that really, they played the, the raise capital game based off of their brand. And they didn't have the greatest margins, right? They, they, they had a huge book. They would undercut everybody that they possibly can. We were priced so well that we were pretty competitive with them. But they just like knew they're going to take a loss for like three years and didn't care. And then they were like, their plan was to try and monetize on year four and five. They didn't realize that a lot of truckers change after two, 2.5 years. Like they, they tend to want to get out of the contract for whatever reason. They're very fickle. Um, but that, that company, that's, that was their game plan. And it, it helped them. They became a unicorn as well along the, along the lines of uh, the, the IPO. When the IPO market was crazy two or three years ago. Um, but now if you look at their stock, again, not naming names because I have friends who work there. Uh, not doing so hot. <laughs> not doing so Strategy hot. matters. <laughs> strategy matters. Uh, I also have a gripe about people with the title strategy, just like having no experience, but yet they have this strategy title, but that's a whole separate <laughs> we can talk about later um yeah and then after that 
left and went to a company called Coefficient, which uh, amazing company. I was in there. I think we were less than, we were about 10 people. I might've been the 10th, ninth or 10th person hired. Um, basically trying to take spreadsheets to the next level. So there's a lot of people that use spreadsheets to the brain of almost every company, right? You're, I use spreadsheets uh, for some basic storage of different ad creatives or whatever. Not anymore because I've got Polymer, but I did at least. Um, and they basically have built out this best in class add-on uh, that allows people to just sync their data, bring their data in, freeze columns so nothing changes. You can build your dashboards off of that. And it's, it's really powerful. They've got companies when we, we got in there, we started the marketing, it set up all of the, the foundational aspects of their marketing, um, started getting their content going. And man, we, we, it was crazy. We, in like three weeks, ended up having like 200 users from uh, Uber on different teams. Uber Eats had about 98 and then Uber itself had about a hundred and some odd people that were sitting there just using this thing nonstop. We, and we were growing like hot, hot cakes. Keep, keep using this hot, uh, mm -hmm analogy but growing pretty pretty quickly we ended up uh, figuring out a little hack in the workspace marketplace so that we could own a bunch of different keywords even though we didn't have the keywords ourselves like it wasn't it wasn't uh something that we even did like it might be the connector that we didn't have and we we learned how to like rank for it on the first like six spaces and that again just took that add-on growth and just hockey sticked it um and then I'm I'm now at a company called Polymer, where uh, I, I got the opportunity to come in and be a senior leader at the company, really help shape the company. Um, the product, when we got here, it was a, uh, the way I described it was, it had a Ferrari engine, but it was sitting in a Ford Pinto with no doors and no steering wheel um, or a clutch. But uh, we took a lot of that AI software that had been built, and now we've built this pretty amazing um wrapper around it, I guess, is the best way to put it, where it'll ingest your data, start giving you this really easy no-code way to build dashboards, do visualizations, ad hoc analysis. So a lot of the superpowers of a dashboarding, like a Tableau, but also a lot of the powers of a spreadsheet. So you can do that. And you can do root cause analysis and correlations, and you don't even have to be a data person to do it any longer, which is uh, amazing. That's that's where we are. Yeah. Yeah. The, the BI without the what, it, BS. It's a BI, right? Okay. So we're, we're positioning ourselves right now in the BI space, but um, I don't think we, if, if you had to ask me where we sit, I think we're a whole different category. Um, but I think the easiest thing for people to grok is BI. Uh, they can kind of visualize what it is. I think they're more so people are blown away when they get in and they go, oh, this is a lot more than, you know, some of these basic BI tools that I would use, right? And it's not as technical as a Looker or a Tableau. I don't have to know how to do Python or R. I can get these these certain slices of data that I want in the, in the right way with, within 15 minutes. I don't have to go back to the data analyst who wants to control my story because he's speaking, no offense, but he's speaking more to finance than he is to the, the marketing person. So the marketing person gets to tell their story rather than uh, the data person telling the story for them. But let, let's, let's scratch that just a little bit more because we all know how important the data is right now. At what point, because it can be extremely overwhelming and then it's just a bunch of noise and, and you're now, let's, 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 <laughs> Let's not be Billy Badass Rand. Let's let's be, you know, knuckle dragger Raj. Yeah. So at what point am I like, cool, my mix panel, my users are making sense. Like I don't need Tableau for BI, but as a founder, as a startup, like how important, and it doesn't have to be polymer specific, but like, or if you want to plug it, go for it. Because I'd love to know how I can use data as a SaaS solution to be better. Instead of here's my Ferrari. I think it has some doors on it. Maybe kind of, I don't know. Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, what's- Actually, I'm going to push even harder for a non-technical person. Perfect. Love it. So by 2025, uh, I hate using them, McKinsey and a lot of these other <laughs> consultants believe that uh, about 70% of all employees are going to need to be data literate in some way. My, uh, my thing is, I think that's bullshit because I think it's going to be really hard to make people data literate because most people speak differently. Even if you're just in a meeting, you can both be saying something and in different ways and somebody might not pick it up. There's a it's gonna be even harder to do this with data, especially with somebody who doesn't know what they're looking for. So with something like Polymer, where you can literally come in and it can just feed you answers, right? You give it a data set, your Facebook, your Google ads, your, uh, your CSV, and it'll just start looking at the data and going, hey, Raj, you might wanna actually, instead of looking at you know, your, your cost per click, look at what is, has the best revenue. Like what's the margins on these five selling products? Right, so they can just spin it up and go. Here's your top five selling products. 
fastest uh, in terms Fuck of everything else, just do those. Like these are the five that are going to be better, right? You're, you'll sell out of these faster, right? Which might be actually better for your business. So you can consistently make that happen for yourself. Velocity, their margins are slightly better, but they're lower. They're lower in price. You're not winning that, you know, thousand dollar piece. You're going to be selling a ton of the five dollar piece, right? Like that is more powerful. And what I think a Google Analytics 4 and a lot of these companies have tried to get to, like if you jump into Google Analytics 4 or even Universal at one point, where they'll feed you up this little thing that just pops up and it's like, oh, 5% more traffic is coming from California. And you're like, that's cool. That's, I mean, for me, I, I'm not that impressed by it. I think most people aren't. They don't know what to do with it. But what if some AI like Polymer was able to look at that and then do a deeper dive for you and start suggesting things that you should look at and build it maybe a dashboard and it's using a bunch of AI in the background that's, and if you want more advanced uh, analysis, you can allow it to go in, look more into your data, right? Like for me, there's, there's phases to this, right? Uh, you got to get to a point where most of this is natural language to them, right? It's just easy for somebody to pick up what you're putting down. And you can very easily say that with some words and then a chart that supports it, right? Um, there's a professor out of uh, NYU, I'm blinking on his name, but he wrote a book called Adrift. And he, he breaks down this, he's, he's a, um, a favorite of mine. I really love reading studies. I'm a data nerd, science nerd. Uh, but he does such a phenomenal way of taking something that's really dense. Uh, something about economics, right? For instance, he'll break it down into a paragraph or two, five, six sentences. And then he gives you one graph that hits so hard against the content that you see. And you're like, ah, I get it. If you just talked about it, I might've gotten some of it. If you'd show me the graph, I might've gotten some of it, but together, boom, now you've hit me. Now I, I, now I understand. I see the entire journey of this data and why you're talking about uh, you know, uh, the amount of, uh, uh, of inflation versus X, Y, and Z. It, and that's, that's uh, what I think the next step in BI is going to be. It's going to be no need for the business person to come in and need to know how to do regressions or code in Python or even no like formulas in a, an Excel spreadsheet. They just need to know, I want this data from this connector, my Salesforce account. I know that I'm trying to answer these questions, but there might be more that I need to learn about this. You connect in with our system, just like Polymer does, connect in, it asks you what you want to bring in. You click on those things, those fields, it gets dumped in and then our AI just starts working right there. And the smarter you get, right? The, the better the moat you build. Another like, like I think here's another thing you think about with the AI, right? Everybody thinks about AI as like back in the day, nobody really knew what AI was. It was some mysterious thing. It really wasn't that much AI. It was just kind of logic trees. If then that, then this and that, and yes and no's and whatever. That's not AI. AI now is something where in most people's mind, they look at a, uh, an application like ChatGPT, right? Where you, it's a conversation. You ask it a question. It gives you the best answer that it possibly can based off of the data sets that it has, right? The sets of data that it has. Um, the next step was like a company like Forethought, which they were pushing the limits of, of AI well before ChatGPT. ChatGPT just made a great consumer product. <laughs> just did such a great job with consumer marketing. Um, and they made it so easy for you to go and solve customer tickets without needing to actually have a human there. To the point where some people didn't even realize when they were using the Forethought, uh, Forethought chat app that people were even, you know, that there wasn't another human on the other side there. Um, and then lastly, you think of these content modes, right? Where it's like Jasper or copy.ai, but that's not, that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to this, right? This whole world is about to change in the next three to five years. And I hate being that person who's like, no, the world's going to change. And then maybe it doesn't change as drastically as you think, but I do think we're going to see a, a big change within the way that we all work. Um, a lot of things are going to become easier. We're going to be trained differently. We're going to be able to access things that we didn't have before. There's been a lot of work, and I'll go back to data, right? A lot of work, the gripe that has always been that there's two things. One is the single source of truth, right? And number two is access to data. Well, here's the problem. The single source of truth, that's also bullshit because every team has their own single source of truth, and they all want to tell their own story the, the way that they want to. AI can help you do that. <laughs> the other side is getting data in. Well, who, who democratized getting data? Zapier. Really, like if you want to think about it way back in the day, they were the ones who made uh, data more tangible for connecting. Platforms. But it ultimately moved in the direction of more technical people really needing to know how like if this then that really works, right? Now, 
you don't even have to have that. You've got 20 companies that are helping any software application to go one click, I've collected my Salesforce in, connected my Salesforce into this product. One click, I've connected this data set into here. And, oh, I've got the CSV that I need to make use of. Throw it into Polymer, boom. Now I've got this pretty powerful dashboard of three different data sources, something I can go and communicate and actually speak to because I know the data myself somewhat, but I at least know the context of what's going on with my manager. I can go to Safe and go, Seth, you know, hey, uh, yeah, I see our CPC is increasing, but look at the conversion rate. Conversion rate down funnel is even better than it was when we were doing cheaper clicks. Cool. That conversation couldn't really be had very easily in the past. Nice. All right. I'm getting off the soapbox here. No. <laughs> I think like we could go down so many rabbit holes, but I think the reality situation, there's going to be so much, there's going to be so much Dunning Kruger going on. Like, Oh no, I, I know this. I'm like, no bitch, you fucking, you, you chat, GB, like stop. And we're all going to get dirty data and we're all just going to be fed by somebody else. Sorry. I mean, this is the funniest thing in the world. And I, I agree. No. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to No, dad. <laughs> it's, um, it's so funny because you see people quoting chat GPT data and it has a lot of hallucinations. And I always tell people when I see it, I'll go, Hey, did you have it cited sources? Because I guarantee you one in every five times that you go in and you tell it to cite its sources. Like I, I do certain things where I'll go and say, Hey, I need you to find me um, an understanding around uh, the Krebs cycle. Right. I'm just interested in learning a bit more about the Krebs cycle. Uh, okay. Sorry. But if you're talking about organic chemistry and biology, get the fuck off this podcast, right? <laughs> you went Krebs cycle on us real quick. <laughs> my side passion. Uh, Apparently. <laughs> I, I read studies every morning. This is my, my nerdy side right here. Okay. Um, but like, it can do a pretty good job of breaking it down. But then I'll go, okay, um, tell me some stats about how the Krebs cycle affects X, Y, and Z, right? And it'll give you stats. And I'll be like, I know that that's not correct. And I'm like, okay, how many phases are there in the Krebs cycle? And it'll, it'll tell you there's 18. And you're like, I know there's not 18. And I'll go, okay, cite your sources. And it'll even tell you, they'll go, some of these numbers might be made up. And you're like, <laughs> wait, what? I only want real citations. And then it'll go and fix it for you. But a lot of people don't know this. They, this is the funniest and craziest thing is because I, I can't wait for kids in high school and college to start like really using this. And they write <laughs> some paper. And they turn it in, and their college professors like, "So Big Bird won the Civil War." Like, no, actually, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Really? Wait, yeah. so Ray, speak to that. What, like, what am I missing there? Again, non technical you know, non technical founder. How is ChatGPT scraping just made up shit? Is this just a bunch of inputs that are just made up shit? Dirty data in, is dirty data out. There's a lot of dirty data, right? And it it doesn't do a perfect job at really understanding what might be sarcasm, right? There, there's a lot of tone. You write. And you have to have a huge amount of QA people tell you what is right and what is wrong. It's just They're scraping the onion them. every day. And I'm like, you're scraping the onion. Like, what? Well, <laughs> us schools are the ones that are training it for them. Yep, exactly. Or they're basically saying, when they give you that thumbs up and that thumbs down or neutral, or even you just copy and paste and use it or tell it this is good, they go and go, oh, that's a signal. This is probably correct information. Yep. So now a they, dumbass like me is validating it. All of us dumbasses, like myself. <laughs> There's actually an open source version. I'm blanking on the name, <laughs> but um, interesting. Uh, when well, I super terrifying, but interesting. <laughs> yeah. No, but they so ChatGPT is you know again for profit and you know they're kind of keeping their data sets to themselves. But there's a there's an open source project which is doing just this, which is they've trained their own LLM on whatever they <laughs> like Internet Archive or uh, you know Wikipedia data, whatever they can consider public domain, and then the responses that are being generated by the community are then reviewed by the community as well. Mm. And they they ask you to kind of go in pretty deep and, and suggest, hey, is this inaccurate? Is it factually inaccurate? Why? Uh, what would you want as a next step? Because, I mean, that, that kind of feels like what maybe OpenAI has been doing the last couple of years and gotten to this point. But it was just interesting to me that an open source like LLM like this could be uh, open sourcing their own, you know, the, the public's help into training their, their AI for them. It's going to be really like, it's going to be very easy for these AI softwares not to pick on ChatGPT or, or Bard. God, that was such a terrible name. Um, it's going to be easy for a lot of these, these softwares to really understand uh, certain types of trades or jobs that are very finite. You do this, you get that, right? That you can trust it, definitely. And when it doesn't have access to current data, right? That's when it's going to start making things up. 
uh, if it has to go into something where it's, you know, more opinion based, like we could be talking about the history of Saudi Arabia versus Yemen, right? Like this, Yemen was what I studied in, in college, right? Like, uh, there's going to be a lot of uninformed opinions online that it's going to get its position from, right? And that's where you're going to need to have a lot of these people that, that are coming in with the real experience who know how to answer these questions. I, how they do that, I don't know, but I don't get paid to do that, so to, to know these answers. But I, I think that's going to be the hardest question to answer because how do you how do you pull apart the guy who has the degree and not to call to authority, right? But like, how do you take that person who might be the authority on this, who might know a bit more about the context versus the person who's just you know, trying to get that C on the paper in college so they can get that degree, you know, C's de get degrees. It, it's going to be- And they've uploaded it to the web. So now it's web text somewhere. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Part of the scraping. Yeah. Man. No, I've been I've been trying to mess around with a project like with auto GPT and stuff. And Rand, uh, I've spoken to both of you guys <laughs> about it. It's, there's a lot of hype around it. I still haven't been able to do anything like product, productive with it just yet, but- um, Seth, uh, Seth, you you helped me set it up really quickly. Like I couldn't find the the API key for this, and Seth gets me in there, and I was like, he's like, what are you gonna do with this? And I was like, you know, man, I I just want to kind of see if this can figure out like an Amazon product that I can sell, just like low key put something out there. I, it is still running. If I look at it, it's still running right now. I've paid nearly eight dollars <laughs> five days, and it still has not. It's like snippets, like small this is the most dense research. It is looking into every different product possible. And I'm like, how do I tell you to stop? Just give me the results. I don't need you to go any further. This is analysis <laughs> paralysis. Yeah. And you're not even a human. I think that's, that's the problem though. Think of it getting analysis paralysis. Now look at, think of us trying to distill it. It's like. Yeah. And that, that is kind of what's happening because even like, at least with auto GPT right now, a lot of the outputs that it's giving before it moves on to the next step are incomplete. So it'll. <laughs> The longer it's running, it'll keep adding snippets of info or, or nuggets to each goal that you set, but you still have to kind of manually go in and like, put everything together. So well, it, it should be fixed pretty soon. Uh, there's one called Lord GPT that I, I'm messing around with these days. Is it better um, than, Autogy or, or than, uh, than God Mode or whatever you call it? Uh, it's supposed to be uh, more like you just said God mode. Like fuck this. Like you said God mode. Like, <laughs> There's one called the words God that came out of your mouth. Like God mode. Hold on, let me play a Nintendo game. Like fuck you guys. I mean, you know that. That's my favorite move in Goldeneye. All right. I'm telling you, man. Just, all right, here we go. Here's my PP7. <laughs> so, um, that, yeah. Some of the names that people are coming up with their their AI spaces, like for these auto uh, agents, it's pretty pretty interesting. You know what um, but, my hype is with with a. Uh, bard and chat gpt and all these guys i put it in i was like who's rand owens they couldn't tell me anything about myself i think i'm a lot cooler than chat gpt does all right <laughs> really sad for me i'm like i've been sued by facebook how do you not <laughs> excuse me very much <laughs> there should be a lot more data about rand owens out there <laughs> thankfully there is <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, oh my no but um uh, i feel like with you know, kind of this next phase. And like, if you look at it, just since GPT-3 was announced, was what, like middle of March? And Dude, then- It went ahead in March, yeah. Yep. And then, uh, so I, I don't have the GPT-4 API, but some of the people on YouTube and Reddit who are, and Twitter constantly who are sharing some of their projects, like GPT-4 is going to be insane. But then at the same time, like you're going to have to pay quite a bit for those API credits or- um, uh, to be able to run those tokens. And it's going to be interesting to see. That's why so many people with auto GPT and stuff, even though you are using like um, for people who have access to the GPT-4, you can add that API. Otherwise you can do three or 3.5. Um, and you, you can tell the difference. Are either of you guys getting hit with these? Uh, I sound like such an old man right now because I'm on Instagram, but are you getting hit with these Instagram ads where it's like, do you want all of the right prompts for chat GPT? Oh, yeah. I'm like, go away, man. Like prompt engineering and, you know, 350000 a year. Get out of here with this. <laughs> <laughs> like, how in the world did these people come up with 101 prompts for ChatGPT, only $99 in which? <laughs> Using ChatGPT. <laughs> how? Uh, oh, man. No, we've been, uh, so bust oh, my hold on, hold on, hold on. That's <laughs> really interesting. <laughs> no, because I have so many. So, like, just think of this dichotomy. Think of the conversation we just had. 
And I was sitting here, I was like, oh yeah, totally. Who would do that? I have had so many startups being like, hey, do you have a cheat sheet of prompts? Hey, do you have a cheat sheet of prompts? I have had so many. So now again, imagine you're in the two percentile, like you're in a quintile that nobody can touch. Maybe because the 90% of this of the lay folk are literally <laughs> just like, what the fuck is chat GPT? And then I'm not using it efficiently. I mean, yeah, no, I I I think it is. You have to double edged sword like a motherfucker, but people are leaning into it like nobody else's business. Again, those might be a subset below you guys with your tech prowess and tech acumen, but realistically, we're lazy as fuck. We're just lazy. And if there's something that could do something for me to add to my laziness, nailed it. Like, why not? Yeah. Like Amazon Prime is it's awesome for a reason. There's a Starbucks across the street from a Starbucks, which is next to a Starbucks for a fucking reason. Like I, I've had so many people who come out of the room, hey, and literally just asking for prompts. I'm I'm gonna as soon as we get off of this, as soon as I get one of those uh, those ads, I'm sending it your way. <laughs> I don't give a shit, Rand, because I have a demo with Polymer tomorrow. So <laughs> oh. I'm serious. I'm like I'm like super I'm super intrigued. I love it. So I love it. I set I a demo for tomorrow. If really. you got me, no. if you got me or Yasser, if you got Yasser or Catherine, I'm gonna be very sad. I I, I want to put you through that demo. <laughs> Catherine, oh, we'll get that, it's that Catherine. VIP. <laughs> you no, know, she's better than I am, anyways. Catherine, so. oh, Catherine yeah. Dean. <laughs> Catherine is a killer. She she'll. She'll do a much better job than I can. No, but I mean, again, think of somebody who, who's a little bit removed, who wants some great data visualization that'll help my story arc because I'm extreme. And, and Seth, this poor kid, this poor kid dragged me kicking and screaming with my pitch deck. He was like, uh, Brad, I'm a Wikipedia page. I'm, I'm hitting every fucking hyperlink. And like so you go to an investor, you go to a VC and you're like, cool, we're digital health. But then, but then we got, we got reach with PropTech and then we got InsureTech and they're like, yo, yo, what the fuck are you saying, kid? Now, if I have one cogent story with some data to picture, yo, that's yeah that changes well, the round race for you for example like a lot of the the csvs that you're sitting with right just throwing them into polymer and and have that engine <laughs> spit out some oh, shit. for you that's a, that's a i mean just just like with chat gpt or at least with gpt4 and uh this new plugin where you can um, point it to browse the internet or browse websites like you know the more you throw it uh, throw at it and ask it to review for you um the better it's going to get at just coming up with those insights or using that data to spit out that output. Super um, but Palmer is kind of doing that for your... Do you have any good props, Seth? <laughs> Not yet. I've been... So, uh, so Busma and I, over the last couple of days, we've been researching more about prompt engineering. Um, and we're looking at it. I actually asked ChatGPT and it spit out an entire, um, like, uh, like a, a small syllabus. Um, I've only read two papers of those. One was the GPT-3 paper from OpenAI. And then there was one that Stanford came out with. Um, <laughs> And we're looking at it more so like instead of prompt engineering, like how can we communicate better with AI? Right? And then obviously we have our own use cases from you know work to like startup studios. Once I get GPT-4 access and can start paying a little towards it, like you know, throw our, our YouTube videos on there, transcribe everything, uh, put snippets out. Right? There, there, it seems like there's a lot that can be done. I have to send you this, uh, this study guys. It's uh, it just, so MIT just came out with a study about um, the effects of chat GPT on white collar jobs. It's Ooh, okay. Ooh. It's pretty interesting. It's I won't give it anything away, but I'll send it off to you guys. And we if we do a poll, well, we can we can jump into it. <laughs> well think God, that's crazy. Think about that. Think about who's going to be retrofitted by you know autonomous whatever. Now think of like the trade person who might not as easily be replaced. That's interesting. Yeah. And actually this is a good kind of segue into because so uh, oh, Rand, shit, yeah. Sorry, thing, I forgot we have an agenda. Don't worry. No, no, no. Uh, it, <laughs> we're, still, we're still rambling and we're just having fun. Uh, <laughs> so, but um, from, so, Rand, one thing I know about you is that you measure a lot, you know, about around your life and then try to build your own spreadsheets. Right. So big time along those lines. And as somebody who even from the early days of SEO, kind of, you know, the white hat, black hat stuff and, and has always had that experimental mentality around startups. You're one of the first go-to-market people. You have to be creative in terms of targeting, in terms of acquisition, the entire yeah. funnel, right? Where do you see chat GPT or similar kinds of learning models assisting you and kind of the companies that you enjoy working with? Like, let's say the sub 10 to 50 employee kind of. I Listen, I, there's a, there's a number of areas, right? And I, I think the, the lowest hanging fruit right now is going to be whether you're in the performance on the PPC side, mm -hmm. um, as well as in the SEO side, right? And I bring those two up because those are two I'm using AI for right now to this, like starting like a week ago. And like we, we're experimenting right now with programmatic SEO. In the past, this has been something where you've needed an engineer, you've got to put out this plan together. 
and like really figure out how do you automate all this programmatic SEO and build all these pages, yada, yada, yada. Well, in like a month, 20 different SEO companies have come out where they've kind of figured out what those prompts are to really build out good content. Um, they can be caught, sure. Uh, Google right now is not punishing anybody. I think when we see at the end of this year, when Google re reports how how many new pages of content have been produced on the internet, yeah. they might <laughs> might step back and go, "Ooh, yeah. <laughs> what do you think about this? This this is not great." Um, More in the last year than the last fifty years combined. <laughs> yeah, but where I see it is SEO. Like you you can literally sit here now because there's a lot of very SEO for the longest time has been this like whimsical ma magic for a lot of people. They don't really understand how it works. But if you've been an SEO and you've worked in it in the past, you know that there is a very formulaic side to it. And it is just a lot of test and figure out what works and doesn't work at this moment, right? Sure, you get some false positives, but at the end of the day, you're going to figure out, did PBN still work any longer? How many interlinks in my pages do I need? Yada, yada, yada. Well, guess what? There's tools now that I can use this that go out they A-B test internal links for you and can figure out within a standard deviation, not even a standard deviation, they can figure out how many interlinks you need. Do they need to be contextual interlinks? Where and what pages do you have to build out right now to support another page to make it rank for the keyword that you told AI that you wanted this AI uh, contraption to, to rank this page for? And it'll do it. I've been playing with it with a few things. We, we've gotten pages to rank in the SERPs and it's like, what? didn't think this would ever rank. This, this used to be a, a process of like, I got to go get 40 backlinks to get this thing at the top. And I, I got to go and do like comb, comb myself through hrefs to figure out what are the pages. And it's making that whole process ridiculously easy. To the point now where I think it's going to change the way SEO works for a lot of people. I know the conversation now has turned to Will chat GPT eat Google's lunch? I don't think so, honestly, because as long as it keeps hallucinating, people are going to move away from it. You're going to have one bad experience and you're going to move away. I think people will still want to read the, from the search engine that they trust, right? Uh, and if they go back and Google just says, hey, I'm, I'm going to build for, you know, being factual, they can, they can do that. Anyways, that was a side note. Uh, my ADD took hold there. But I do <laughs> think that AI is going to disrupt SEO, the largest. I think we're already seeing it. You can look at a company, I'm not going to give up the name because uh, they're a competitor of ours but I, and I'm sad about it, but they, they went out, I looked at them starting at the beginning of March to the end of April. They had zero keywords outside of their branded keywords that they ranked for. They started using a, a product called Byword. They automated all the content for how they build out functions. And I mean, it, it's not great content, but it does the job. Functions, um, glossary, whatever. AI is gonna take anything that really doesn't need to have a super technical understanding of your own product and be able to automate that. And they were able to get to, they quote 750,000 uh, searches per month. I don't know that I believe that. I think that they got close. I think they probably have, you know, maybe half a million from all this, but. They did it in two months. That's unheard yeah. of. That's unheard of. That never can enable a lot more people. Lot Do you know how many content that. writers they just replaced with this one uh, software product? And nobody has to go in and really edit this copy because it's not something that's living like right there on your fundamental like editorial portion of your website. It's a branding effort and it's a traffic effort. Like, cool. So I think that's where you'll see you've got other products out there like uh, similar.ai who are going in They're by the way, these guys at Similar AI are awesome. They, they built and sold an SEO company to Yext way back in the day and they got into this. Now they're going to be the, the king of interlinking. And, and there's a lot of power in interlinking. A lot of people who don't do SEO don't know really the power of this. They hear backlinks and they need just that. Interlinking is just as powerful in many ways. And they're automating it. They're taking a bunch of companies that are huge companies and helping them. It's, yeah. So I see that. I think the other two areas that you're going to see it is in uh, in creative, like brand creative, because it can easily start testing. It doesn't have to just test against your website, which is what we've always done. It's like, I need X amount of traffic and X amount of time to really figure out if this creative is working on this A-B test. No, no, it can go out to the web, start putting it in different places, aggregate the data, 
and start telling you real answers about your, your creatives that it's built. It built itself. On the PPC side, it can go and run through every different headline really quickly, building out multiple variants. I think that's gonna be one of the bigger areas hit. Yeah. And it's going to be a lot cheaper, like replacing yes. most of these tools are also in, let's say, in the 10 to $100 a month kind of range. So you're just going to be stacking, uh, you know, a, a new SaaS, let's say, yeah. for each part of the funnel. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm i hoping that it's not going to replace a ton of people. I'm hoping that it's just going to be like the age old thing where new jobs spring from it. I don't know. I I think... This is my bet. I think that this revolution is not going to create a bunch of new jobs. I think it's going to create a bunch of new small businesses, which is what I really think that we need to get back to in this country is like, now I'm sounding like I'm running for a political position, but we need to get back to small <laughs> The heart of America. <laughs> Got to put my Clinton out right now. Um, but yeah, no, I, th I think that's what it will actually do. I think it's going to, sure, you may not have to be working for the Goldman Sachs of the world any longer, but you might go and start your own business with this. You'll, you'll go and get it built. You'll figure out how to use it to start an e-commerce company or an affiliate business or you name it. I think it'll, this is going to make a lot more people uh, do the things that they're passionate about rather than work for a paycheck. Um, and, and Seth knows me. I am generally a curmudgeon with my outlook on the world. I'm, I've got a very Hobbesian perspective on human beings. Uh, this is probably the first time Seth has heard me be positive about something like this. Normally, <laughs> yeah, it's going to kill everything and we're all going to lose our jobs. No, I think it's going to create a lot of opportunity. Yeah. And I feel like that perspective also comes from somebody who's been in tech, but has, you know, is one of those non technical founders who is just as critical, though, because like, you know, usually uh, you hear it left and right that if you're not an engineer at an early stage startup, then <clears> chances <throat> are you're not really going to be um be as valuable yeah then when you put in like a product-led approach where it's data creation experimentation funneling all that insight into what needs to be done then you realize pretty fast like you're you're very much in a sales function um not not even marketing from the from the traditional sense so yeah very very valuable yeah so like tell me a little about because you you're being super humble today. We we lost over a couple of different projects, which you know were just as uh, impressive, but didn't really go anywhere. But I know that you still keep you're you're just as much in the trenches with whether it's SEO or with the, this new tech. Um, on the personal side, we are you're a health nut, um, which you know kind of. I at first I thought Raj would give you a run for your money, but no, you're like ten times. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, Raj, Raj, you're pretty jacked. <laughs> Listen, coming from Seth, I'm good. We're good. We're Seth, we're good. <laughs> We're good. I mean, yeah, Seth, what's up, dude? <laughs> no, but, um, you know, like even a lot of the <laughs> people don't realize that you don't need to be technical in today's day and age to be able to analyze that kind of data set. No. And I think what you're doing with Polymer is it, it fits you perfectly in that regard because you're probably just your own workspace has a bunch of different things. In there. I was, uh, I mean, you're not wrong. Listen, I, I love Polymer because I know the pain, but uh, I also love Polymer because I track all of my aura ring data and like I, I put it in this massive spreadsheet and I just threw that into Polymer, started playing with it, figuring out like, can I play with a certain amount of alcohol or does it just all screw up my HRV? Like, does my HRV really even matter at this point? Like I, I hit that four ho five deadlift or three reps and I was out till 7 a.m. that morning. Like, so now I, I love it. It's 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 definitely showing me the outliers that I want to believe in are wrong. Um, it's definitely the correlations are there that I do need to uh, work on some HRV and maybe get to bed a little earlier. But it's hard when you live in New York City and your and your girlfriend wants to go out and party all the time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, blame her, Rand. <laughs> I will. You know what? I, if, she, if she hears this, which I'm going to make sure she listens, baby girl, it's your fault that I party too much. She'll be proud of that. Honestly, be proud of that. Uh. Yeah. No, please don't stop partying because that, that was very much a reason where like you the kinds of people that you bump into and then are able to work with is next to none. Like I learned most of my networking skills from this guy. And the testament to that is that most of the guests that I'm going to be bringing this uh, to this podcast are people that he introduced me to from, from working oh, together. 
you're, you're not giving yourself enough credit here, man. We, we... No, he's giving himself plenty of credit. Right? You're good. You're totally I work good. with you, or I work with smart people. So yeah, that's my credit. I appreciate. Uh, it. I'll take it. I'll take it. So like. Because you, you still work with quite a few founders on the early stages. You still get your hands dirty, um, you know, from whether it's building it from scratch or even like leading teams. Um, I'd like to hear more about like your ideal founder fit. Like who do you enjoy working with and in what what capacity? Because that's also, you're like the, like one of those, um, what do you call it? Like those stories that people hear about the kinds of people that are needed at the early stages. But most people don't really get to hear that perspective. I don't know if you guys can hear this wind. Yeah, just a little. <laughs> Apparently, Palm Springs has a, a, a ton of wind at this time. Nice, yeah. um, pulling me off. Uh, <laughs> but if you were asking me about, uh, you were asking me about what's my, my type of person? The, the types of companies or the types of startups that you enjoy working with. Man, listen, I. I don't discriminate uh, in terms of like what I like to work with. Like, I don't care as long as it's something that I feel that I can do justice to. Um, that's what I'm, I'm open to working on. Like I've, I've had multiple com people come to me that want me to advise for them on certain aspects of their business. But I don't know shit about their business and I'm going to waste their time trying to get up to speed, learning about it and may not give them that great of like advice. So I just don't do it for me. It's, it's gotta be a place that I really know. Like I'm, I, I'm, I'm pretty damn uh, good at uh, the aspects of SMB SaaS, right? Like if you are looking into SMB SaaS for that, that matter, I probably know that, that sector pretty darn well. If you're talking about uh, a lot of this new like biometric data and what goes on there, um, that's another space where I live. Like I'm, I'm passionate about it. I do the, the research, the work there. If it's MarTech, I'm there with you. Uh, if you're doing something that's low tech, like even working with, properties or or any of those things i'm there um i i so you know I, I worked with a guy named steven who's still still a, one of my favorite human beings out there he's a great guy he, we built a product together that was you know it's the, the product that we got sued by facebook from uh and it was in it was in marketing and it was really more of a not a super technical product but steven came up with some really cool stuff where he like built a headless browser and like we started scraping people's ads using these add-ons in Chrome and whatever else, but um, <clears throat> that was just marketing. It was just something that I knew and I, I was passionate about and still am. And that's why I was able to do, we, why we were able to do well is because we both were passionate about this and knew that industry. If it was something that I'd gone, I, I'd gone into, like I talked to a company um, about a year and a half ago that wanted me to help them advise on some of their growth strategy around universities. And they're building this product out that helps students with their growth in college, where it makes scheduling time with a, a, a professor easier. It does all of these different things around that, really getting students ingrained. I had to tell the person, like, I don't know universities. And if you were to ask me, like, my best bet, I don't think you're going to make money from state universities. Like, we went to San Jose State. I don't think San Jose State spending money on this. They did not give two shits. If you got into a meeting with your professor, you, I had to work hard to get into meetings with my professors or even with the dean or whatever else. Not that they don't care. Love San Jose State. But that's just my experience. I don't know. I'd be like, yeah, you're going to have to go talk to Cornell or some of these Ivy Leagues and Harvard and go get them to write you a big check. But I wouldn't even know who you talk to. I wouldn't know how you market to a professor. So I don't know. They asked me like three separate times. I'm like, I can't. I'm not going to be helpful. So I guess I answered more of like what I feel like I wouldn't help with. <laughs> but uh, I know that when I hear the pitch, when I hear the pain, if I know the pain, I can be of real value. And even, well, <laughs> let's say once you, you have identified the pain right, for, for sure. a pitch or whoever, um, what, at what point do you, or what do you enjoy doing for them? Um, where do you I, can, where can you provide the most value? I, I hate using this term now. I'm going to grab my, my parents' puppy here. <laughs> get her on screen. This is Betty. Hi, Betty. She's been harassing me all day. So now oh, she's, she's awesome. harassing me put on, uh, on the internets, on the interwebs. <laughs> she's, she's six months and does not know how to not go to the bathroom in the house, even though we've been <laughs> really working hard to train her on that. Oh, Betty. Oh, little baby. Um, 
sorry, can you can you ask the question again? Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, all good. Um, let's go. Let's say uh, somebody who's viewing this episode, right? They've understood what you don't or what you're not good at or what you don't want to do. But let's yeah. say they fit in the, that area of, okay, like we fit. Uh, I, I think I can convince Ren to work with me. Let's say you've gone through the pitch. You, you, it's <laughs> the main point that you also recognize. What, what's your sweet spot afterwards? Like, Listen, where can you provide? There's a ton of places that I can really be of, of help. Um, but the places that I really love, depending on the stage of the company, is helping to ident identify the ICP and actually listen to the, the people that they, they work with that want to pay for their product or they think they're going to pay for their product and actually know where those people are communicating, where they live on the internet, right? Um, there's a lot of dumb marketing that goes on, and I'm, I'm more about smart marketing, figuring out where those people live because it's not all the same, right? I, have a, I had a customer who's in a very low tech space, not customer, or a place that company that I was um, advising. And the only place that these guys bought software from was uh, through their Slack groups, their own private little Slack groups. Their share groups is what they called it. It wasn't even on a text message. Story. It was a little tiny Slack group that was like 40 of these people and there were hundreds of them. And that was the only way these guys bought any software, which was the weirdest thing for me because I have never come across that. Normally you find them in certain places, maybe you start out at events or whatever else, but if they're really low tech, but I got my hands dirty, figured out where their, their channels needed to be, how they communicated with them, what words you stay away from, what you do. Um, I, I remember the answer I was going to give you as well is like, I hate saying this, but um, I'm a great growth hacker. I, I'm I, I, not to brush my shoulder off, but to brush my shoulder off here. Uh, you know, I, I'm really good at finding the things that don't scale really early on that have huge benefits. And then helping you to build out those things that scale later on. But there's a lot of stuff that you have to do and get your hands dirty that don't scale. And I love figuring out those things. Like I said, with uh, figuring out the, the Google Suggest hack, that was something that doesn't scale, but it was a really fun project that ended up having some great rewards. Um, yeah. That's Can you I speak a little towards that? Because like, you know, when you come on towards a, with a team, you're kind of you're part of the exec team you know you've got a lot of trust and a lot of respect from like the ceos who you work with directly like going from a an experiment run or, or let's say from one a change in mindset from before you joined to now you coming on board and, and applying these your, your system and uh, some of these processes like what are the challenges that you know you've seen I don't know if I'm wording the, the, the question correctly. Like I'm trying to figure out a way where you can highlight what happens when you come on board versus what was happening before. Because they, they, it requires a mindset shift from the founders to work with someone like you. I, so two things, because you, you mentioned one thing, right? Um, I'm fortunate enough now these days that I don't actually even have to pitch myself when a company wants me to be an advisor. Uh, I just get deal flow thrown my way from people who are like, no, you got to go talk to Rand. I, I worked with Rand in the past. Like he'll advise you on X, Y, and Z. Um, and uh, so that's, again, toot my own horn, but I, that, I'm in a, a privileged space these days where I don't have to do that any longer. And I'm, I'm not doing that as much these days, just to be honest. Like I, I've, I still work with some companies as an advisor, but my hours there are very minimal. Um, I'm, I'm heads down in Polymer for the most part. Like that's my, that's my baby. Um, but what I do bring in these situations, the, the, the change in mindset is realism. Like I, a lot of times, especially over the last, like, I would say into 2020 and 2021, I met with a bunch of different companies and they were all wanting to outsource everything. They wanted to outsource the sales. They wanted to outsource, uh, their creative. They wanted to outsource, they just wanted to build, but the CEO at one of the companies didn't want to do anything. And I was like, you can't outsource this if you don't know it right? You can't, you have to go get your hands dirty and I can help you get your hands dirty. But again, I can't be the only one getting my hands dirty here. I, I can give you my experiences where I'm learning from these people and give it out to you and like help you. But ultimately, you know more about this space and you're going to need to go out there so you can check your bias. Like that's what has to happen. So more often these days, I'm bringing a very realistic approach and like kind of slapping them in the face that you can't just outsource everything and you can't just build a, um, a growth hack that all of a sudden gives you this viral growth that doesn't happen 
listen, that, that these these viral stories are such bullshit. You you have twenty thousand failures and like all these small steps before you get that vast that last real big kick and you figured something out. But if you'd done that growth hack before all the other steps, it wouldn't have paid off. Like you had to get through all that shit. You had to shovel all that shit first to get to that growth hack that actually took off. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of founders really early on don't don't understand that. Uh, and that's you know that's a that's a part of the learning lessons for a founder. They 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 want to believe what they want to believe a lot of the time. And I always tell them, I go, hey, listen, I think you should go test that out. Just go do it. And when it doesn't work, if you want to come talk to me, let's talk. We can get to get back to reality. But that's how I work. I guess it's coming full circle with the way that I communicate. I'm not always great for the the corporate life, but better for the small startups. <laughs> <laughs> You do need somebody who you can trust to back up with data why something is or isn't working. <clears throat> Agreed. Agreed. Oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, on the, like, Raj, any other questions? Or Man, I think that's just so interesting. It's like, it's something that so little waiting goes on, but it's wildly important. And I we don't know what we don't know. We just don't because it will spend so much time like prioritizing other shit. It's like, Hey man, like dial this in, yep. just dial it in. And then you have that next iteration, but we don't know it. We just don't know it. That's the hard part. Yeah. I think that's the really hard part. I mean, it's a superpower to know what you don't know. Right. Like that, that, that's a good one. That is a superpower in the startup world and, and actually at any capacity of your life. Right. Like that's, that's in my opinion, when somebody will tell me, I don't know these things. I yeah. don't know this about my market. I don't know this about my TAM. I, I'm like, awesome. Yeah. You're being reasonable. You've got some insight. That's a, that's a superpower right in itself. All right. Because you're in that place, you're open. Yeah. You're willing to go and test. So I always look for that when I, when I see people in a, as a founder, I'm like, you got to be staunch in what you do know, but be really open to what you don't know. Like, don't have an ego about it. I mean, when when founders finally come to this understanding or realization that they need somebody like you, like what, in your opinion, should they be like judging somebody who who claims to be a growth hacker? Man, this is a. Uh, it's funny you bring this up. So there's a a person that I follow on LinkedIn. She's she's basically a, a works with a bunch of different VC groups, and she comes in and helps to figure out do the teams actually know what they're talking about. Are they being reasonable about their expectations? And then she goes and helps them figure out how to sell, right? Like that's gotta be step one before you figure out how to sell. What are those things that you do and don't understand? Um, and she recently wrote a post about, um, she's like, I'm putting myself in the line of fire here, but I think any seed stage company should never hire a VP. I, and I wrote back to her and I was like, and, and this is my answer to that question is, I don't think the title matters. That's a yeah. Right? Like, what the fuck, dude? My dog is the VP of pooping. Like, yeah. enough, enough. Yeah. You can go, listen, it's, it's a means to an end. It's like a, it's like a, a weight at the gym. I can get in great shape without the weight, but I can accelerate getting into better shape with that, right? Like, there we go. So I wrote back to her and I said, the truth is that most startups hire a fast talker. Somebody who has all the chops to be a great salesman, but may not know a lick of customer success or marketing or whatever else, but they're a great salesperson. Um, on the other side of that, a lot of seed and series A companies, sometimes series B, will go out and hire that CMO, that C-level person. I keep coming back to marketing, right? Because it's, it's intrinsic in me, but uh, or that VP of name the title. And they, they, they hired them because they worked at Deloitte or they worked at Google as this title. And you're like, but do they have startup experience? No, they've never been in the trenches. They've never had to go arm to arm with you in the trenches. Um, they've never had to battle. They've never done any of these things. Yeah. Another thing that I look, I look for, and I always tell them, I go, this is, you know, it's an old school thing. You always look for people who are like uh, athletes. Like there's that athletic hiring thing. And people want to hire the people who played a lot of team sports. And I think team sports hires are great when you've got a product that has product market fit and you need people to join hands and go and do things. But really early on, you need the guys who were the wrestlers who are fighting for themselves, the guys who are playing singles and tennis, the guys who are, you know, you name it, that, that independent player, sport player, that, that person, that's who you need. You need that person who's a go-getter. It's going to be aggressive. 
that knows what it, it feels like to depend on themselves and not have all of the resources around them. They are not going to be able to go and offload something on another teammate. You got to hire that right person who comes in, has worked in the trench, been at the right companies, but not something so senior or hasn't forgotten. Right? I, I watched it happen at a, a company that I worked at where they hired a VP and also at another company, a, a CMO. And the people didn't last nine months. Yeah. Because they'd never been at a startup. They had no idea. They had a great logo on their resume. They had been there for 10 years and they were in the right industry. But guess what? That doesn't always translate. You're going to have all the domain knowledge, but you've never done anything. You've just been at the top being a talking head. Not going to mean anything. We literally, we literally just had this conversation this morning. Two tech star guys, brilliant. And one of the people they brought in was a CMO, blah, 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 blah. blah. But if we, 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 we took a step back and we actually scratched that surface rate and it was exactly what you said. They were CMOs that got promoted from a CMO from being like X number of employee and then a, a roll-up. So the roll-up put them in a CMO and then two more roll-ups that were CMOs. So they've been CMOs at three monsters. They went to a startup and they're like, you, you've iterated the logo for three months. You you haven't driven. Grant, they, they were, even the founder was like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing and I'm generating more revenue. And the CMO person or whoever it is, and we can we can metaphorically replace this with anybody with a burden of knowledge. They're like, right, but did you blah, 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 blah. Like, no, I don't care about whatever ego stroke you're doing here. Like we're dying. Like you're supposed to do blah, blah. And, and it's funny. It's a lot of this. It really is. I mean, this is like the age old thing, right? You see the person, the person comes in and they go, especially if it's marketing or sales or CRO, right? If you're a chief revenue officer who's never been in the trenches, a customer, a, your CMO, whatever those are, COO, the first thing that they do, and this is always the sign of when you know they fail, when you're not right for this job, they'll go, we need to redo the website. And you're like, no, that's never the first thing that you do. You don't just come in and put your stamp on the website. Like why? You want to go with something that is going to take nine months to do? That's what you're saving your ass so that you have nine months leeway redoing the website. And then if it doesn't work, oh, well, it took nine months to get my salary. I'll, I'll jump off to the next big company. For fuck's sake, that's exactly <laughs> what they were talking about. The messaging on your website doesn't match the messaging of your vision and your mission. And they'll lean so hard into it. I'm like, listen, if you don't want to talk to me and you just want to go take some shit on Google, like we're not going to, like, we're not going to jive. Yeah. Listen, I think where were you three months ago, dickhead? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's exact uh, brand. But the messaging on the website doesn't really match. Like you can't do anything. And we don't even want to talk to people until we switch it. Don't even talk to them. Don't talk to people until you switch it. Because then the messages are so mixed up that you're not going to get sales if, because you're going to sell only through the website. Like, wait, oh, I feel like we're wasting precious you, time. You go talk to people so that you can set the right expectation with the copy on your website. You take that logic somewhere else. You take it somewhere <laughs> else. <laughs> well, yeah, because it's not enough time for people to get their buildings in. You need your nine months, and then when you leave, you hope they accelerate your, your shares. <laughs> uh, well, that's where every experiment takes a quarter. Oh, my. Yeah, that's the other thing. When somebody's like, you, you, they come in, and they're like, okay, well, we need to just, they're, they're like, um, what is it? Their they're deal that they'll make with the founder is like, okay, you don't want to build, rebuild the website. Well, then like, let's, let's re, let's change the, the compromises. Let's change the, the messaging. And they'll say, no, I don't want to change the messaging. Okay. Well then let's AB test. Right. And you're like, if you're a founder who doesn't know how long that takes and your website gets a thousand visits in a month, you're going to be testing all that new copy for a year before you really figure out what works. No, instead the founder needs to go, no, we need to get on a bunch of calls with people who we think are ICP, let them tell us their pain, what we then think our benefits are, look at their face, right? Like ask the questions and look at their face. Their face is going to tell you more than their mouth. You're going to say something and they're going to go, nah, or this one, and you'll say something and they'll go, and you go, okay, we got the benefit. That's one the emotional lean in. Yeah. The emotional lean in. Yes. Like, oh shit. If you could help me with that. Yeah. We, there's a, a great book on this. And we read this at, uh, at Polymer when I first got there. I recommended it. It's called The Mom Test. Dude, The Mom, the mom test, test was like the one thing everybody said, The Mom Test, The Mom Test, The Mom Test. It's an outstanding book. It's so basic, but I love the basics. It's so basic. And any person who does like, you know, who does ICP work or wants to do the, these types of things, they'll go, ah, yeah, The Mom Test is good. And whatever. You're like, yeah, it's actually pretty great because it gets you straight down to the basics. It's practical you can follow it step by step and you'll get more than you will if you just don't do it or you go and try an ab test or even if you try and do it yourself 
You're going to get more if you get them on. Do the month test. It's an easy read. Should, shouldn't take you more than three days to finish. <laughs> I think I read it in a night. It's, it's small. And you get out there and you start getting some, getting on the horn. Do you know what Obeyed and Shoaib did when they were getting ready for, um, for their, their company, uh, Keep Trucking? They would drive down to Bakersfield. I guess Bakersfield is a huge hub for trucking. And they would show versions of the mobile app. They would talk to them about their pains, their experiences. And they just let the horse's mouth go. And those truckers would talk. And they recorded everything. That's why they had such great positioning. That's why they knew what features to build right off the bat. <laughs> they didn't build a lick of code. They were driving down to Bakersfield and no one wants to be in Bakersfield. No. <laughs> All right. That is the asshole of California. And I'm, I'll stand by that. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's, yeah, that's a uh, customer acquisition and feedback right there. Yeah. A customer discovery. So. Customer discovery 101. And it, customer discovery should be continuous, right? It's not, it's not like, hey, my product is never going to evolve. So this copy and the pains of my customer will never evolve. So this, this copy will always work. No, you continuously do this <laughs> until you become a bloated enterprise. And then you have copy on your website that no one understands. You don't know <laughs> what you're getting when you sign up, sign this form. But uh, before then, you just continuously work on that discovery. Understand the pains. People will tell you what they want and what they're pissed off about. Because it's way easier to feel angry than it is to feel happy. <laughs> uh, now this is this is a lot of fun. I think uh, we got a lot That's of a awesome tidbits uh, out of it. Um, no, and and like, well, you know, I'm uh, when we were thinking about like what the podcast was going to be and stuff. Like that's why I kept telling Raj, like, hey, we got to get Rand on here. Not only because I keep using your network and will continue to like milk off of you, but um, you know, it, it's. Like as somebody who's worked with you in the past and seen the success that you've had and, and the kinds of companies that you work with, like these kinds of perspectives you normally don't really hear about. It's usually the CEO to like just you know talking about growth hacks and stuff, but an actual CMO or a VP of marketing, just a growth hack and lead. Um yeah, this uh this was a, a lot of fun, man. Thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, man. If you ever need a, a part two and you guys just want to shoot the shit, let me know. Uh I'm always can always make myself available. This is fun. Um Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, uh, we're thinking about like doing some other like follow-on conversations where it's limited to a certain topic. Um, but you know, yeah. Otherwise, it's just friends uh, talking and and kind of uh, sifting through ideas. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Raj fun. usually, yeah. Raj usually ends with a with a very uh, what existential. It's lame. It's 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 guy Raz how I built this. So, you know, percentage wise of 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 where you're at now, Rand. Hundred percent luck versus hard work oh wow uh, so that's that that's the response from the user that you want that's the one you're like oh shit i gotta poop oh no <laughs> that is um that's really really hard right i i think luck is more timing in my opinion like that, that's what we define that's the way i define luck it's timing yep. it's just right place right time um <clears throat> that said i'm a big believer in willpower and if you're a hard worker uh, you can manufacture something. You may not ever become a unicorn or whatever, because that, again, takes timing. It takes that luck. But I think it's 70, 30. I think the hard work was 70% of like going out there, doing the things that you hate, but knowing that there's going to be some type of light at the end of the tunnel, Yep. 70%. 70 the other 30% is the timing. Uh, we can look at a lot of great products that I built early on that had they... Had they come out at the right time, probably would have been a year. And unfortunately, it just was the wrong timing. So they got acquired and they made hundreds of millions instead of a billion. You know? Team like, traction timing. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah. I'm also not a big believer in this whole uh, um, your, your pedigree or your degree or the school you went to has any effect. I haven't looked at the data, so I probably shouldn't be making that remark, but I have a feeling it's um, it's also a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> I think there's probably just as many just as many failure rates out of any other university as there is. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, hopefully we can uh, we can research some of that data on Polymer and yeah. <laughs> throw a report report out. Yeah, that would be in, uh, some good insight. <laughs> in hey, go uh, now this is a lot of fun, bro. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Um, always fun catching up.
And then we're gonna get you back for part two. Yeah, in the future. yeah let's do that. Let's light some shit on fire. That's sweet. But to all our viewers, thank you so much for being with us. Um, again, we uh, we try to highlight friends of ours who build companies, and then that because we know them on a personal level. If you do need a connection, or if you're looking for somebody who can solve this kind of particular problem, Raj and I are available through the concierge. Uh, have a free twenty minute conversation with us, and then if it's a fit, we'll make that intro, and uh, you know, hopefully connect a good company with one of our friends who also has awesome experience. So, um, but yeah, join us next week for another episode. And until then, thank you for being with us. Take care. And the recording. <laughs>